so let's talk about how many WISPs are there. Um, there is a WISPA organization, the, the, the UK Wireless Internet Service Provider Association, and they have a map of all the WISPs here in the UK. And that's the ones in Scotland, for instance. So there's quite a few, and you can go to that, that link there, and you can see all the, all the ones in the UK. There's also a WISPA association for the US and various other, other countries as well. I mean, all this technology is pretty much all around the world, okay? So who am I? Uh, my name is Bill Buchan. I've been in IT for 35 odd years, uh, 25 of those as a senior IT consultant. I live in Aberdeenshire, south of Aberdeen, and my local area had terrible broadband. Yay! With no hope or little hope of improvement. Thank you, BT. Is there anyone here from BT? Because if so, I will really thank them for making broadband so terrible that it gave me a business, okay? Uh, we started in 2013, and afterwards at the bar, I'll tell you how we started. Uh, we now have 850 paying customers, 1,200 antenna, 1,200 routers, four one gig lines, three members of staff, two vans, four generators, and a dog. The dog, I can keep. Uh, so I've got about nine years building and running WISPs. Uh, let's run through an example. So my internet is rubbish. That was me in 2013. I live in a lovely rural village. I'm not going to move from there. There's a fantastic pub next door. I'm not going to lose that. But the internet speed was less than two meg. Yeah? Even YouTube didn't move. How can I fix it? Well, the newest fiber cabinet at that point was in Montrose, 7.4 kilometers away, next to my vet. I took about my dog. Now, I'd heard about this long range Wi Fi stuff, but I understood the need to clear a line of sight. So if I draw a line between my house, my Bill's house, and the vet there, it's about seven point four kilometers. Has anyone ever used Google Earth before? The desktop application. It's very good at this sort of stuff. That's just literally draw the path, right click on the path, and you can see how long it is and that sort of stuff. And what's more, you can get the cross section of the earth along that line. That thing there is a hill. This <laughs> is 10 meters above sea level. And there's my house, about 22 meters above sea level. And there's a 17 meter hill in the way. Okay, so either I can try drilling through there with an enormous laser, yeah, but that's not going to work. Or I could come up with a different route. And this is what you end up doing when you're a wireless internet service provider. You find obstacles and you find ways around it, you find ways around it. What we did is lots of nights in the pub and lots of driving around. We found my house, and the lady who ran the bar of the pub, Mary, she could see my house from her house, but she could also see something called the buyer. I'm not quite sure, that's a, it's a Scottish word for a big cow shed. And it's a big cow shed. And the buyer could then see the pets in the drawers. So it's an eight kilometers of hall, a four kilometer hall, and a two kilometer hall. Well, that's fantastic, that's really good. So that, this means I could actually get decent internet. How do I do this? Well, lots and lots of Google Earth. We checked out with binoculars because Google Earth elevation doesn't know about trees. Trees are quite useful. Uh, they, they grow quite a lot in Scotland because they were quite wet. And most of them actually grow at the tops of hills, but it doesn't really help us. But check with binoculars, obtain agreement from landowners because if they find stuff on the side of their building and you haven't asked them, they're gonna get really annoyed. And these guys have got guns. Okay, so don't, don't piss them off. So a new elevation profile from the buyer, which is up here, and that's 100 meters, and again, the best, and we have the 10 meters. You can actually draw a straight line, and it won't go through this hump here. So in other words, we've got clear by the side. And we can prove that by going to the buyer with a really good telescope, or a good spotting scope, a single lens binocular, and we can actually see the building. Yay. So our main site, the buyer, you need a number of things. You need height and power, okay? You can run off-grid. Everyone goes, oh yeah, I'll run some solar panels and a little wind turbine and a few batteries, that'll keep me going. No, it won't. That particular site now has a 450 watt budget. We need 15 solar panels, two turbines, and a literally a ton of batteries to keep running. That's way too expensive. And also off-grid systems get stolen. They're very expensive. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm not what you call the classiest dresser or not. I don't have any money, okay? <laughs> so off-grid, too expensive for us. We like farm buildings because farmer doesn't really care about them. 
Okay, we can nail stuff on, it doesn't blow over. We can get decent line of sight. In fact, we actually mounted the stuff on this wall here, and you can see controls. That was all we did. One last thing is that okay. black stuff there. Do you not want to? Sorry, that black stuff there. Well, you know what cows produce? Yeah, that was 120 foot long, 20 foot wide, and 10 foot deep. And my God, it stank. Yeah, you can only imagine. So that's a good idea. That's, that's our, our main site. It's got power. Um, a few years afterwards, we, we kind of expanded a lot. We ended up with a whole bunch of different dishes there as well. That's not how it looks just now, but that gives you an, an, idea, an idea of the expansion. <clears throat> Let's talk about antennas for our fictitious link. We're going to talk about four main types of antenna, okay? Now, it doesn't matter the radio package or the frequency, but the antennas themselves, the actual physical antennas, they have a big, um, a big impact on how, how things work, okay? This is an omnidirectional antenna. It's a stick, okay? If you look at the right-hand diagram, that's a radar diagram, that shows you how strong the signal is on 365 degrees as you're looking from above. So it's telling you you get an almost equal signal all the way around, okay? So far, so good? Now, in the UK, we're limited to a maximum of four watts of power regardless of the device, the antenna, the distance, whatever. Four watts in the 5.5 gig range. So if I'm gonna put out four watts of power, I wanna make sure it works for me. So that kind of antenna is really good if you've got a whole bunch of people very close to you, yeah? But that's not gonna work for a long distance, my eight kilometer link, okay? Let's keep looking. We've got another type of antenna called a panel. It's a flat panel. This is actually a panel antenna. It's actually a flat panel. And this is a flat panel. Okay, the idea is a flat panel will project a signal 180 degrees in front. And if I've got 10 customers here, that's a really good device for that. The guys behind, you won't see anything. But it focuses the energy towards the front. So panel antennas are really useful and more cheap. Okay, remember, cheap. <laughs> so that's a good example of a panel antenna where the, the strength is being pushed out to one side. At the back, you see these little lumps. These are, you know, these are a result of the antennas being quite cheap. These are interference bits being stuck out the back. So they're not 100% pure, okay? They're not perfect. Here's a parabolic dish. This is a classic Sky TV dish or whatever dish or whatever kind of dish you want. In this case, the centerpiece, the thing that sticks out is actually an active antenna along the side of its stalk. So it's relying on the signal hitting the dish and reflecting into the stock. Okay. A satellite dish, such as a sky dish, it, re it relies on an arm and it being focused into the, the end of the arm. Okay. So Wi Fi antennas tend to use this kind of fixture. So it's quite easy to spot what kind they are. And sky dishes, satellite dishes tend to use a longer arm and that way you can focus more power. Okay. So this is really good at focusing quite a lot of power. And again, if you look at that, particular radar diagram, you can see that we can push that quite a lot further, but only in a very specific direction. Okay, so far so good. Last but not least, we've got the horn. It literally is a horn. It looks like a horn, it smells like a horn, because it's a horn. It's an old fashioned horn. And what you can see on the right is, you can get them in various widths, and that will give you a very, very even radio spread in a particular direction. And that's good for a whole bunch of reasons. Firstly, all the power is going there. And secondly, you're not interfering with the one next to it. So you can put four or five of these up in quite a dense configuration and not interfere with each other. Okay? So that's really important. So horns are good for that. So we've got four different antenna types. <coughs> now let's talk about the architecture of this example. Okay? That'll get, that'll get a lot more fun in a second, I promise you. Individual customers are going to access our network and we want to authenticate them onto our network using some sort of authentication mechanism. In this case, it'll be a radius server. You've all heard of a radius server, right? It's a very, very old fashioned authentication mechanism. It can then pass the router down information about how fast the link should be going. So we can give each individual person their own speed up and down and that sort of stuff. And that's exactly how your Zen or your BT or any other broadband provider works, okay? I want to make sure that everything in my house can't be seen by Fred up the road in his house. 
Okay, that seems like a real statement, the obvious, but it's actually quite difficult to do in some respects. So we want to make sure there's network isolation in my house where the guy next door can't see and vice versa. Okay, so my network is different from that network. My network has got its own password on the Wi-Fi and so on and so on and so on. So I can't go into my neighbor's house and go into his Wi-Fi. Yeah, those are all things that you, you'd expect a good wireless internet service provider to do. And that's what we have to do. I'd like to be able to change the wireless infrastructure, like change over this dish, that one or that one or whatever, without breaking the customers. Okay, so I'm going to separate it into, into customer stuff and transport wireless stuff. And I, I need to be able to work on the transit, the transit, without breaking the customers. Seems like a statement of the obvious again, but again, it's quite an important consideration when you're designing this. Okay, and we want to add encryption over the top. We want each individual link encrypted between this and the client, and we also want the routers to encrypt between the customer and the wide over here as well. So if you were to tap the internet port listen and listen to my traffic using Wireshark. Then you still can't see the detail. Okay, so there's two layers of the picture. And that's kind of what I'd say. You. So far, so good. Any questions? Great. So remember our three legs. Leg number one, eight kilometers. We're going to choose a dish because we need it for the distance, right? Leg number two, four kilometer. We can go dish or panel. But remember, this is going on Mary the Barmaid's. Sorry, she's not going really to call Mary the Barmaid. That's terrible. But Mary's house, we don't want to. Put a honky big dish in the front of it that will look ugly. So we'll use two panels. And in my house, we use a small panel. We literally we use one of these. Yeah. Obviously, a new one is coming in. Clean the water. You get the idea. <coughs> so each location, well, the metal will need a dish. The barrel will need a dish and a panel. Mario will need a panel, the panel, the panel, the panel. So far, so good. And the metal will need a router and then media sound. Because we're going to plug into VDSL ADSL and we're going to use that for backhaul. We need a switch to join all the stuff at the fire, a switch all the stuff that buys, and me, I need a router for me. Money needs a router as well, so it's a custom router. So we've got like a, a list of parts we need for each location and how we're going to connect them. Okay. Physical installation. All of the WISP devices we talked about all use power over Ethernet. Okay, so I'll literally run Ethernet cable and I can run power over it. Use injectors. So this is me and this is it. it takes an Ethernet cable in and pushes out a power over Ethernet connection out. And we can then run 40 meters, 120 feet, to the target device. So typically these would be inside where it's nice and dry, and these dishes would be outside where it's nice and wet. Okay, so the trick is not to put mains outside. So everything is power over Ethernet. Is everyone, everyone happy with that? Do you understand what I mean by power of Ethernet? Cool, okay. The risk voltage is similar to the lag setting new standards. So Ubiquiti took the 48 volt Cisco standard that Cisco used on the phones and said, no, we don't want that. We want 24 volts and we'd rather run it over two pairs instead of four, if you don't mind. Uh, so if you accidentally plug one of these things into a Cisco voice over IP phone, power over Ethernet adapter, it'll blow that device up. Thanks, Ubiquity. For a whole eight cents, maybe 10 cents, you've, yeah, and so on. So watch out for power over Ethernet. It might not be what you're thinking it is, so always check, okay? We've, we've lost a lot of devices by blowing them up. So don't do that. <sighs> so we're on a shielded Cat 5e or Cat 6 cable. By shielded, I mean, um, you should be running shielded cables anyway, but these are outdoor shielded cables as well. So they're resistant to rodents and more importantly, they're resistant to UV. If you run an internal network cable like one of these outside and leave it in the sun in Scotland for maybe three years or anywhere else in the world for maybe six months, then, <laughs> sorry, not a lot of sun, then the outside sheath will become crumbly and actually fail. Yeah, and you don't want that. You want outdoor cables to be UV proof, okay? So don't use indoor cables outdoors because it'll just bite you in the backside really well. Happen to us. Um, and we use Ethernet switches to join all these things together. Um, typically, we advise at least 30 minutes of battery backup. Who here lives in the country? Two of us. Who here has reliable power? Nobody. So there are power cuts all the time. Usually because a big storm came through and wrecked everything. But you guys in the city, you get power all the time. It's amazing. 
my, my lights flickered last night. Ooh, I was at a power for five whole days. Yeah, so <laughs> I should back up. We're going to choose some plain old off the shelf stuff. Uh, there's a couple of distributors that have this in the ITX. Uh, that's who we buy our stuff from. They're both very, very good. Some people, some uh, sometimes stuff stuff is in stock with one and not the other, and vice versa. That's why you should probably use two. We're going to use Ubiquity Kit for the antenna. So this is a Ubiquity device here, for instance, and we use microtech for the users. Uh, when I made that choice seven years ago, there was a lot less kit out there, and it was a it was a very, very easy choice. And the easy choice was microtech wireless stuff was rubbish. And ubiquity routers were rubbish. So we ended up getting ubiquity wireless stuff and microtech routers. So that seemed to work quite well. And it's still a valid decision today, thank God. Okay. So for instance, we use 952 routers. This is a package customer. And we use this kind of package for the antenna. So we use this kind of package for uh, the, the, the VET, the live router. So you can have maybe 80 people off of one of these routers. This costs about 150 quid. Does that make sense? So far, so good. Whew. What this means is we now have to choose some backhaul. By backhaul, I mean internet that provides us with internet that we can then sell on to the customers. Okay. Now, I first built this table maybe seven or eight years ago and I had to change it a few times to make it slightly more up to date. But running from the top, VSAT or geostationary satellite, a latency of around 800 milliseconds ish. 700, 800, 900, thereabouts. So if you do a ping, I'll come off the satellite, go to the ground station, ping off Google or whatever, come back to you, it'll take about 800 milliseconds or 0.8 of a second. So that's serious satellite lag, and you've all been in a satellite phone call where you go, hello? Hello, <laughs> yeah, and so on and so on. So satellite's very good if you're in a very remote place, but it's very bad if you want to do, you know, near time things like speaking, um, video games, that sort of stuff. So latency is important. Starlink, uh, relatively new, around about 110, 120 milliseconds. So pretty close. You can actually use it for voice. And it's just a little bit annoying. Yeah. Um, it's a satellite base station. Anywhere above ground, it says. <laughs> but the, the proviso with Starlink is it needs to see the horizons. Because Starlink wor works on LEO, uh, low Earth orbit satellites. And it needs to see the whizzing by. And up here, in this latitude, up near, near, near the, the top of the coverage area, there's not a lot of satellites. So it'll, it'll use satellites that are closer to the horizon. So if you've got trees, hills, that sort of stuff, but we're famous for here in Scotland, then that might work less for you. The other thing to bear in mind is that Starlink, the consumer device, uses a lot of power because it's continually moving its dish. Okay, like 100 watts of power all the time. And that's a big price consideration, would you believe? But on saying that, it does work. Look at Ukraine, they turned around information in the Ukraine war just by giving them 100,000 satellite terminals in the space of two weeks. Absolutely amazing stuff. We looked at using Starlink for some of our uplinks for some of our smaller sites, and we decided not to because, firstly, it's quite expensive. Secondly, their terms and conditions don't allow it. And thirdly, the amount of upload isn't really enough for our customers. If I took 10 of our customers and gave them a Starlink, download might be fine, but upload would be terrible. Okay, so. We're not going to use Starlink. Sometimes we might, but not, not on this one. 3G, 4G, 5G. Okay. So this device, this is actually a Magitek wireless. But in here, you can put a SIM card. And this will actually connect to a 3G, 4G, or 5G base station and get you something like 60 to 120 meg, depending on the load of the base station. And this is actually quite a good access point for an individual user or a cluster of three or four users. So theoretically, we could use this. This is about 120 pounds. Even at a marginal area for 3G or 4G or 5G, that outside pointing in the right direction will make a huge difference. Yeah, we've had some very marginal customers who are able to, to service. Now, latency in your 3G, 4G, 5G is again around about 120 milliseconds. So gamers, sorry, it's not good enough for you guys. And you have a fair use package. It's called here. The max. So fair use is where Vodafone say you can use maximum 600 gigabytes in a month. That's our unlimited package, but that's the fair use. So if you go above 600 gigabytes in a month, they'll switch you off. That's their idea of unlimited. Okay. What they're doing is they're punishing people who are using 3G, 4G, 5G sims for continual downloads. 
they're trying to restrict people using the SIM cards for actual broadband and especially torrenting. That's the, that's the one they're looking out for. So in some packages, that is actually a fair use. If you look up the, the first slide at the, G, the GSAT stuff, on the economy packages for uh, satellite, you'll be restricted to 10 or 40 gigabytes per month. Now, the UK average is around about 350 gig per month. So you get the idea of 40 gig per, per month really isn't enough. Yeah. So watch out for fair use. And then you've got wired. So wired ADSL2 or ADSL, ADSL or ADSL2 or VDSL will give you 40 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds to 40 milliseconds. Again, ping time, which is not too bad. And that'll go over your local ISP, net, ISP network, i.e. BT or whatever, and you'll buy a package from BT or Plusnet or Zen or ANA or um, uh, Converged or whoever. Yeah, All these people can, can sell you that package. And the difference is price and how much back end they've got. We buy all our VDSL circuits from Zen because they have unlimited unlimited packages that mean unlimited. And that means they don't slow down between seven o'clock and 10 o'clock. If you buy a budget VDSL package from Plusnet or BT or Sky, they will slow down. And that's because they've got more people fighting for the same bandwidth at the back. The contention ratio, how many people have they got fighting for the same bandwidth? It's not 10 or 20 to one, it's 40 to one or 60 to one. Okay, so that's the difference between cheap internet and expensive internet. Okay, so far so good. And a VDSL circuit will cost you £34 a month, whatever. Um, then you get into <coughs> things like FTTP, fibre to the premises. Okay, fibre to the premises is where a uh, city, uh, city fibre will come around and, and plug in a fibre at your house. Okay, and you'll plug in a device and you'll plug in your router, and that's great. They'll sell you a package at 100 or 500 or 800 or, or a gig, whatever. Yeah, but you're sharing that backbone between yourself and maybe 50 other people by the time it gets to the exchange. The contention ratio on open reaches infrastructure, deep on infrastructure, is around about 16 to 1 maximum, and other providers go up to 32 to 1. So it really depends on who you're buying with or where you are as to what choices you do have. <laughs> but generally speaking, if you use less than two or 300 meg at a particular point in time, then that's fine. It will just work. If you try and use a gig all the time, then that's a bad example for you. And my screen just went dark. <laughs> cool. Oh, there we are. It just timed out. I was talking so slowly, it went to sleep. I'm really sorry. We're almost done. <laughs> so FTDP is still a shared internet service and it's asynchronous. It's, it's, you know, you get more download than upload and so on and so on. And last but not least, we've got your actual leased line. That's where you get a piece of fiber and that other piece of fiber goes somewhere really in interesting and it goes somewhere interesting like Pulse to Edinburgh, the uh, internet exchange for Scotland, at which point there's no contingency, you get that whole one gig, okay? And you'll pay 500 to a thousand pounds a month for that. Okay, so that's your price difference. 500, 1,000, 30, 40, 50, 30, 30, 30. 5G unlimited sims go for around about 25 to 35 quid a month right now. Satellite can start off at 100 and go up to 1,000 quid a month, depending on just where you are. So there's huge price differences, there's huge latencies, and there's huge fair use implications as well. But bottom line is, if you live in a town, you go along to Neil, you say to Neil, I want a one gig lease line, and you'll say, that a few hundred quid, there you are. If you come in the middle of many camp where I am, I'll charge you a thousand pounds a month for the same thing because that's how much it's going to cost me to get it there. Okay, so rural internet is all about who's got the infrastructure closest to me that I can use to provide to my customers. Okay, so far so good. <coughs> right, uh, last but not least, uh, when BTC are going to charge you 12 quid a month for your VDSL, Remember to include the £20 a month line rental charge they haven't included. So it's actually £32 a month. No one ever remembers that. So when we come along and say we're going to charge you £30 a month, they go, well, PT's only charging me 12 No, look at the entire bill and have a fair comparison. Yeah? So watch out for that. Okay. Whew. We took a long time to get here, but there's been a lot to get through. Now, this is actually how we put it together. So starting at the other end, that's where the internet comes in. Let's imagine a Zen service, and it plugs into our ADSL, uh, ADSL VDSL modem, and it plugs into our little black router, the, the guy over there. And then we've got a daisy chain of long range links, eight kilometer, four kilometer, two kilometer over these dishes. 
Okay, and then it finally comes down to my router in my house. Woohoo! And I can get 70 meg down and 20 meg up over that, which is great, which is better than my two, right? Now that router will make a PPPoE connection, okay? By PPPoE, I mean PPP is point-to-point -point protocol. It's an old dial-up thing from like before even I was born. That was a long time ago. Um, no, no laughs in my life. Tough tried. So PPP, very, very old protocol. PPPoE is basically a way of encapsulating everything that I need to get to the internet over a single connection at that main router. And that means I can't see the stuff in the next customer or the next customer, because I can only see the core router and the internet. Okay, so we've encapsulating all of the stuff in this network into that one connection over the core. And that means I can have as many hops as I like um, between my router and the internet. And as long as it makes that PPB connection, I don't care what's in between. So I can swap out these devices for faster ones if I want it. Yeah, so that's what I mean by separating the transport for the, the, the router and the and the uh, wireless stuff. Okay, so that's kind of, in, in a nutshell, how to build a WISP. So you understand about line of sight, you understand the equipment, you understand the decisions we made for each of the antenna types, you understand uh, the <laughs> some of the decisions behind the technology, and you understand what we're trying to achieve. And we end up with a shopping list, and we end up with a total of 960 quid. Okay, so for just under a thousand quid, I can provide you with internet at a location eight kilometers away, and you can add another 20 people to that, okay? For a cost of one of those dishes and one of those routers per house. Because remember, some of these things do point to multi-point. You can service up to 20 users from one of those flat devices, okay? So that costs us a total of 70 odd pounds a month for the Zen media cell connection, and I can divide that by 20 and so on and so on and so on. So if I wasn't providing much power or speed, then I can make a lot of money. And when I first started off, all, all everyone wanted to do was surf the net. Yay! And then within about a year of me starting, people started using Netflix. Ah, <sighs> Netflix. So everyone now is running five or six or seven meg continuously between 6 p.m. and midnight on multiple devices to their house. Now, Netflix is good at buffering and caching, but it's not that good. If you only give the person one, one meg during peak times, they will notice and they will complain. Okay, so as soon as I put on my wisp using my original figures, I have a contention ratio of 20 to 1, guess what, Netflix came along, and I need to move my contention ratio to 1 to 5 or 1 to 3. Okay, so my cost went up. Yay! Okay, but you understand the, the methodology behind that. So we put together a wisp for about 960. Uh, this equipment cost 665 years ago, thanks Brexit. Um, it cost about 200 quid for drills, brackets, all that sort of stuff. Three or four hours per site. Uh, sometimes I have a long ladder. Who's scared of heights? I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it could be fully secure. AES2 between the antennas and PPB encryption, AES256 between the routers. So even if you tapped in the middle, then you weren't going to get anywhere. And customer sites are isolated and it's costing around about £75 a month for a single media cell connection. Okay. So you could literally buy two or three bags full of stuff go off to some remote part of the country and within about a week have a long range network up and running and servicing multiple places at the same time in a fully secure manner. Okay. People have done that in the past. They're called terrorists. Um, <laughs> they, they found that um, quite a lot of the stuff was popping up all over the place in, in Iraq during the Mosul times and that sort of stuff as well. So um, literally anyone can use this. Okay. So far, so good. Any questions on that? I think I just about lost everyone, and it was quite a lot to take in. So that's £75 per customer? No, per month. That, per month. That, that's for the VDSL connection at one end. Per month, per customer? No, for, 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 for the whole thing. Okay. I, I was paying for one VDSL connection and sharing between 15 and 20 people. Yeah. I would charge them £20 per month. So if it was 10 people, I'd be getting in £200 a month, I'd be paying £75, and so on and so on. Not a lot of money. <laughs> okay, let's move on to technology. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to technology. Hello, screen. There we are. Okay, so just a quick word on WISP manufacturers. If you're going to start a WISP, then you probably want to start with. There's a question. Oh, there's a question. 
if you have a small group of houses, would you use some form of wire connection at the end? <laughs> That's a good question. Now, some people would not do that because if there was a shared service at the end of the C block of flats and that person went on a holiday, then nobody else would get their stuff because the power is off. Okay. There are ways around that. You can reuse something called a reverse PUE power adapter that takes in seven connections from seven different houses and runs the shared kit. We start doing that as well. But if you've got two or three properties that are joined together, then yes, I'd have one incoming and share it between one, two, three, four, maybe six different properties. Yeah. The reverse PUE switch will save you back about 200 quid, but you know, by the time you get to the third property, you're back in profit. Okay. And also, they've only got one honking great dish instead of half a dozen. Yeah, because they might get a bit annoyed about that. Yeah. yeah. Is that answered? Okay. So if you're going to go off and do a, a WISP, here's, you know, five, six of our manufacturers, a Ubiquiti, Mimosa, Bankrotic on the budget side, um, Ciclu, uh, Cam Cambium uh, on the, the right-hand side. Cambium really is the, the blue chip stuff. That's where all the big corporates go to because the kit's very, very, very good and very, very expensive and doesn't require you to swap it out every five years. Okay, so it's like the, the, the quandary of the poor man's shoes. If I was a rich man and I paid 200 quid for a pair of shoes, I'd never have to replace them because they're so good. But if I'm a poor man, I'll pay a pound every year for or 10 pounds a year for a pair of shoes. I'll end up paying more for shoes, cheap shoes than expensive shoes. Yeah. So again, if you're going to go down the wisp route and you, you know you're going to be in it for a long time, as we hope we are, then you'd buy the expensive stuff and get much more lifespan out of it. And that's what Cambium's good at. Natonics are really, really odd. They're created by a WISP and they basically found there weren't any good switches that provided power over ethernet power. So we've got a 24 port switch, 24 antenna hanging off and every single antenna is in a different VLAN with a different power requirement, 24, 48 volts, whatever, one wire, two wire and Natonic switches can, can deal with all that. And that's a great way of basically saving having 24 power bricks kicking around, for instance, yeah? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great control thing because you can actually reset the antenna from the switch by switching it off and on again, which if you've ever seen the IT crowd, is a secret to good success, to good support. If you can switch something off and on again, then that's it. You can do support. Okay. <coughs> you think I'm kidding? <coughs> <coughs> Apologies to everyone, I've just coughed up. <sighs> on to something slightly more serious, and that was frequencies, okay? Um, so far, we've focused on the five gigahertz frequency, and that's what most of this kit here will deal with. Okay, but there's other frequencies we can use as well. For instance, 60 gigahertz is the resonant frequency of oxygen. Yay! You know what that means? It means it can only get two or three kilometers because it really is pushing against treacle. Yeah? Now, the plus side is it can only get two or three kilometers, right? What that means is, even if there's a a dozen people four kilometers up, up the lane firing their, their, their signals at you, you're not going to hear them, right? So that means for a very short link, you can use as much power as you like and there's no interference, unless you cause it yourself by having multiple devices, yeah? So 60 gigahertz, there's no license requirement. I can have as much of that stuff as I like. And guess what? For under two kilometers, I can run one gigabit between two devices all the time. And for 200 quid, that's really good value, right? So there's, so there's some odd bits and pieces. So five, five gigahertz is relatively cheap. When you get into the license, 11, 13, and 18 gigahertz, it's really expensive. So we've got a two gigabit connection that runs over seven kilometers on the 18 gigahertz range. That costs us 4,000 quid a year in license costs from Ofcom. Yeah, that's a lot of money, but it's still cheaper than a two gigabit leased line in the middle of nowhere. We're still cheaper buying two gigabits lease line in the middle of town and then pushing that out. Yeah, so there are cost benefits. 70, 80 gigahertz is a very small license cost, but it'll do up to 12 kilometers. So we link the cost is maybe 800 quid for both devices. It will do 12 kilometers at a gig. Yeah, but it'll only do it when it's not raining. <laughs> Oops. So <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed that this is about Scotland, but we do have weather. So in those instances, you'd have a secondary backup five gig link using cheaper hardware that's better tolerant of, of rain. Yeah. So you've got all these considerations as well. Okay. Last but not least, we've got the two gigahertz range, which is the redheaded stepchild. 
uh, which is a terrible expression to use, but it, it, everyone hates it. It's really good for indoor, uh, but outdoor is just really spammy. It's, it, the, 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 the spectrum is just overused. It's really difficult to get any sort of link working on it. Um, and that's your frequencies. There'll be a short exam in this later, so pay attention. No? Okay, fine. <laughs> How do we get a gigabit of data with a signal this big? Well, what you do is you send multiple bits at the same time. Yeah, Morse code is a good example of one bit per second. Beep, 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 yeah. Let's imagine you're able to send two tones a second, or four or eight, or 2048 bits in a single frequency pulse. That's what QNAM 2048 means. And that's how you can pack two gigabits of synchronous data in a very, very small channel. How do you get 2000 bits in a single frequency pulse? Firstly, you're gonna have really good signal. So you're going to transmit a very high power signal and a very, very low background radiation signal such that you've got a whole bunch of signal to play with. And secondly, you need big, fast, expensive dishes at either end to do all the processing to get that in and out. OK, and lastly, you need really good antenna that will go down to minus 120, 130 dB in terms of being able to listen, because that's the bit that pays off. You can shout as much as you like, but if the, if the dish isn't listening, it's not working. So there's a whole bunch of antenna and frequency and, you know, those sort of dynamics to work out as well. So it's not all as simple as just buying some off-the-shelf kit if you really want to sort of go for it. Yeah. So it's all about QNAMs. There's a IEEE spec there you can go and read if you're really, really, really bored. It is fascinating, but yeah. So if we look at... If we look at this particular device, and this, is, this is quite a high power radio package, and this then uh, literally wires itself into a big antenna. So we'd use this with an antenna literally this big. Um, and this guy, he will produce this. So the top part of that bar is actually what's happening right now in the five gig spectrum. And you can see various peaks of other radio equipment. So we can see what else is being transmitted. We don't know who they are, we can just see the power. On the, on, the, on the spectrum. So our trick is to find somewhere that this guy can operate in between all of those, yeah? Now, you could look at that all day and you still won't get a complete picture. This is, um, this will tell you over time to avoid that red bit, for instance, that red bit is congested. You wanna avoid that, you wanna go for a nice, you know, bit like that. And that will allow you to pick the right channel. Because previously, it was literally pick and pray and you spend hours trying to find a usable channel, you know, this will at least tell you what a usable channel is. So that makes your life a lot easier. So it's, it's actually quite, quite interesting compute power in these devices. This is a 200 quid device for God's sake. This is a really good spectrum analyzer by itself. Yeah. Some fun. Here's some example sites. This is a 40 meter pop-up mast. One of our farmers had already. And it's, it's, it's a telescopic mast, and it's hideous and awful. And we tend to have to use a cherry picker to get onto it because it's not really climbable. The one in the middle, I can't really point, I can't really point to it. The one in the middle is actually an eight foot by eight foot two ton container with half a ton of scaffolding on top with maybe 15 radios on it. Now, the, the, the radio closest to it is a, it's a one and a half meter, 18 gigahertz. License link. Now that antenna said that the pair cost 7,000 quid. So you don't want to break those, right? Bear that in mind. <laughs> the last one is a small rural community with maybe 10 houses. And what we needed was a big one meter big sick loop, 5,000 quid link pair on that pole. That pole is actually a four inch drill pipe. It's an old North Sea four inch drill pipe, which you can pick up for about 300 pounds. And our local farmer is very good at manhandling those around. He sank it on four cubic uh, tons of concrete, and then we have a very, very good pole structure. So these, those, you know, this is how you do it on the cheap. Like that container costs us 500 quid, 200 quid for scaffolding, and all of a sudden we have a really good antenna set. So you can do it on the cheap. Bear that in mind. You'll have a laugh later. <coughs> Networking. How am I doing for time? Oh, okay. 40 minutes in. Um, we're about three quarters way through. Most small WISP operators aren't necessarily big in the network. We're talking single people, jobs, maybe three or four people, that sort of stuff. They might not be big in networking, that sort of stuff. They'll use mostly flat bridge networks 
Uh, sometimes they use VLANs if they figure out what those are. Um, and then as you get bigger and more experienced, you use routed networks. Now, anyone here a fan of Ethernet? Okay, so how many devices can you have on a single Ethernet before you get ARP storms? It's about a thousand. An ARP storm, ARP is a low-level protocol in Ethernet that says, hello, my name is, or my address is, and my MAC address is this. And this is what machines use to route between themselves on the same network. So the Ethernet protocol ARP actually becomes a bottleneck if you have very, very large groups of the devices on the same actual physical network. So you tend to find, as you get a bigger WISP, you tend to break in small rooted pieces, and that's very, very difficult, and so on and so on. So that it has to be an indicator of competence, as I would say. Most WISPs tend not to have their own AS number. They tend not to have their own backhaul links. They tend to use uh, internet from, say, TalkTalk Talk or somebody else, and so on. And they piggyback over existing ISPs, such as Neil, for instance. Neil, Neil provides service to a whole bunch of WISPs in our area. And maybe using satellite as well as wired, just for a bit of fun. OK. In terms of our example, the core router, the little black one, ADSL to the internet, and then we use PPPoE from the client over to that, over whatever network we had. Okay, that's kind of how it worked. We're using NAT on the customer router to get all of the devices of the customer router into one address. And we're using NAT on the line router so that it all becomes one public IP address as well. Okay, that's pretty nasty. Yeah, that's not a great way to run a network. Okay, because you'll end up with Situations where Google, for instance, will say, well, hang on, there's 100 people behind the single IP address. I'm not very happy about this. Or they'll start switching stuff on and off. Or if one of those 100 people misbehave badly, then all of a sudden everyone suffers. Like Office 365 decides not to accept mail from you. And that really gets customers going. That really does. So double natting is not great, and so on and so on. Um, so watch out for that as you grow up. Each customer router will rely on the PPP connection to the core router. Um, and that means we've got isolation between each one. We talked about that earlier. Does that all kind of make sense? Yeah. So this is just reiterating what we're doing here. Up along the top, we've got IP addresses on the devices themselves. That means we can log into these devices and see what they're doing. There's a, the, we've got a little web page and everything. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. But we don't want the customers to get to those. So the customers will do a PPP connection from the router back to the black router, the core router, and they won't see anything in between. They'll just see that layer two PPP server at one end, PPP connection the other, and they won't care what's in, in the middle. And that's kind of how we run it. That's what a bridge network looks like. Okay. And that's just reiterating all that sort of stuff. Last but not least, remember on the client router, you're going to provide DHCP and DNS. Okay. If you don't provide DNS on the local network, guess what? They're not able to resolve bbc.co.uk, obviously. So, yeah. Has anyone ever heard of filtered DNS? Okay, malware. Anyone knows how? Does anyone know how malware works? Let's imagine I click on a dodgy site. It downloads some sort of malware to my, my machine. Not a Mac, obviously, because Macs don't get that. That piece of nasty code will then use a DNS address to try and get back to its command and control center. Okay. Now the great thing is the guys out there monitoring this stuff will very quickly flag bad DNS addresses. And what that means is if you use a, a smart DNS provider, then they can filter those out, okay, very, very quickly. So within hours of that command and control center coming online, that DNS address is filtered out of all of my customers' DNS entries. And that means if they click on that link tomorrow and they download the malware, it doesn't go anywhere because it can't talk to the command and control center. So that's what I mean by filter DNS. So that's another service you might want to provide. And a lot of companies do that internally. And Cloudflare's DNS 1111, I think, is that 111? Is that Cloudflare? Um, it does that as well. So not all DNSs are the same. Okay, so watch out for that. We, we use a Quailbone, it's a, it's a Czech company, and they, they provide us with, you know, filter DNS. Okay. Larger ISPs, uh, they go towards, you know, rooted, uh, VLANs, dedicated radius server, and so on and so on, network table distribution uh, via OSPF open 
So <laughs> open the shortest path routing, uh, first routing, and that means you can have loops and, and whatever. I'll show you that in a second. And then ultimately that black window would then have BGB connect connectivity out to a real internet thing if it wasn't Zen. So that's the different that's a different protocols you can see in a bigger ISP. We're not really going to talk about those just now because I'm kind of losing you guys. So remember my original example, that was my original network, and this is my network now. It's full of these little green dots, which are line routers all over the countryside, and they have multiple routes in between each other. So if one goes down because of power, I can route around it automatically. And that's what OSPF gets me, is the ability to have multiple paths. Okay, so I'm just making the point that larger, more complicated WISPs will have multiple paths in the network. Yeah, so far so good. Okay, who uses WISPs and what do WISP traffic get? Well, 90% or above streaming TV. Neil, is that what you see as well? No, it's not for you. You do a lot of business users. Uh, ours is 95% uh, domestic. And every time we look, it's 80s, 90s, 95s. It used to be just Netflix, now it's Akamai for Sky, it's uh, Amazon Prime, all that sort of stuff. It's like no one watches terrestrial TV anymore. Or indeed this. <laughs> if I flick this, there we are. Um, so we, we had the contention ratio rant already when I said that Netflix screwed up my business by you know, making me have a, a larger contention ratio. Okay. Management, how do you manage this stuff? We talked about 1200 radios, 1200 routers, 800 customers, and so on and so on. Firstly, you're going to have a CRM. <laughs> So just the reaction of one of the audience members. You're going to have a CRM, a customer relationship management thing. It's going to deal with your customer contact information. It's going to deal with your billing. It's going to deal with email addresses and phone numbers and all the stuff you need to keep your customers happy. We rolled our own using React and Node. Bay, and that's caused such a reaction among, amongst the back row here. Uh, because we required mapping. We required good mapping. And a lot of newer CRMs in the WISP community, Splinx, whatever, are now starting to provide that good mapping as well. Okay, so there's some, if you want to set up a new WISP from, 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 from start and from scratch, then have a look at Splinks. Here's an example of a map that we used for our particular thing. This is our CRM generated from our records. It's showing different states of different customers using colors and numbers, depending on where they are on the pipeline in terms of how far we are through installing them. Now, the fun thing is, we use a MongoDB backend and it has geolocation information built into each record. So we can do searches in Mongo and say, here's a polygon, give me everything within that polygon. And that's really interesting being able to do geo lookups on a database, right? That's pretty cool. As you can tell, I'm really a programmer, right? <laughs> but understanding exactly where the customers are is really important in terms of line of sight or how you can install fiber and all that sort of stuff. So our own CRM does quite complex uh, mapping using React Leaflet and various other bits and pieces. Uh, I could also tell you um, who's in our coverage area. We, we kind of <laughs> we kind of defined this coverage area. I've got to admit, I was uh, um, I, I originally did this as a joke. It does look like something out of Teletubbies, but it is trying to cover the, the upper end of a glen there, um, so it does look rather rude. Uh, but this is telling me all my customers are within this area, and this area is um, drivable within an hour from our, our location, which is. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> so yeah, you get the idea. So kind of middle of our area, we're happy to sort of stay within those boundaries because you know if somebody in Albany said, "Do you want the service?" We no, because there's Connor, there's Neil, there's very few people who up here will do a far better job. Okay. So mapping is big. Radius servers. We've been into radius. Radius actually stands for Remote Authentication Dial-in User Service. Remember dial-in? Does no, no, you don't. You're too young. You don't remember dial-in. <laughs> Number of free and paid for ones, we, we recommend Splinks. The check based, there's a, a quarterly charge per customer. So the bigger you are, the more it costs. But we actually see that as a huge investment. They're very, very good. The support's fantastic. So every time we screw up the database, they fix it for us. It's fantastic. Those guys are great. Okay. Here's some of the stuff we get out of our Splink servers. The top, top left is our dashboard, 798 online customers. On the top right, you see a list of tariffs and how many people are using that particular tariff at that point in time. So I'll get my glasses. You'll see that on the right, we've got 232 people on the consumer package, which costs them £25 a month and gives them 11 meg down and 4 meg up. 
at a very, very, very basic package. And we're trying to get them to spend more money with us by upgrading them at some stage. On the bottom left, you can see for a particular customer how much they downloaded per day. So when they called and say, it hasn't worked for a week, I want my money back, you can see, well, I'm sorry, but you downloaded 70, 70 gig last night. 60, I did. Yes, you did. <laughs> and on the right is a live bandwidth chart. So as I look at that customer when they're on the phone, it actually tells me second by second how much they're actually using at that point in time. And that's great for just sorting out arguments. Um, UNMS is a ubiquity, ubiquity network management service. It's a free tool. They give it away with the, the devices. And it will do quite in-depth in, in mapping. On the left, you've got, again, a dashboard showing our network is 98% or whatever happy. On the right is every single link and every single customer color coded depending on whether we think they're working or not right now. Okay, so that's a really good network visualization tool. <clears throat> they also give us the ability to actually map out individual sites. So we've got switches and cables and blah and blah and blah, whatever. And we can actually put a complete network diagram for each site into here. And then it shows us on the right, you can see an antenna and it's pointing out to all these customers and the colored lines tell us how good that link to that customer is. So it really is quite a, a good tool for keeping track of all this. It's not bad for free. On the top right, you can see a map for an individual access point, a transmitter, and you can see where all the customers are. Again, that's really useful because that's telling me that there's a maybe a 90 degree spread there. Yeah. And if I wanted to use a 60 degree horn, that wouldn't work. I would have to use a 90 degree one on the top right. And last but not least, you saw the elevation profile from Google. Um, it's showing you something called a Fresno. Um, if you imagine a five gigahertz radio, you know, link, maybe four kilometers long, there's maybe a 10 meter or 20 meter pipe outside of that single point to point, that if you put anything in there, then it's going to affect the signal. It's called the Fresno zone. And that means you're going to mount these things way off the ground and away from buses and trees and houses and hills and stuff. But you've also got to mount it so that you've got like a, a five or 10 meter clear area alongside it. And that's what that Fresno zone is trying to tell you is based on the local topology, you, you're missing the top of that hill by quite a bit. That looks good. Yeah. So that's what that bottom right graphic is showing. Okay. Everyone's going, there's a lot to this, isn't there? <laughs> yes. Um, we talked about earlier picking the right channel for your transmitter. Well, Ubiquity on, on that package there I was waving around earlier actually has something called Air Magic, and it talks to all 16 stations that are hanging off that and says, well, what do you see at this frequency? And then it gives you a suggestion as to what the best one is for all 16 devices. And that's really revolutionary. That's, that's, that's made our lives a lot easier. Because previously we had to do that on paper. It would take half a day. Now, if you've got 1,200 radios, that's, that's just a lot of days, right? So, <sighs> so far, I've talked a lot in depth about what goes right. All the things you should do right. All the things that, you know, you should do properly. Well, here's all the things that don't go properly. Firstly, power. If you run a WISP in a rural community, you will need... Lots of those generators. Those are awesome. Those are champion generators. They cost about 600 pounds. Why is it awesome? You see that time readout on the front? It's telling you based on the current load and the current fuel load and the current fuel, uh, 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 the fuel capacity of the tank, exactly how many hours, minutes it's got to run. Yeah, and it will run for up to 16 hours at a time. And that means you can leave it running for 12 hours at a time, safe in the knowledge it's not going to run out. Yeah, invaluable. It's worth 600 quid just for that. So you're going to need a lot of those. As I say, last big set of power cuts, my house is offline for five days and I'm in a village. Yeah, most of our customers are offline for seven or eight days. It was hell on earth. Yeah. <laughs> Can anyone tell me what's wrong with that picture? That's right, it fell over. It actually blew over. This is Storm Arbor or the next one, I forget. Basically, uh, the two ton container with a half ton scaffolding on top. And you see that antenna at the top, the 7,000 quid link. Well, thankfully, it fell that way. Yeah. <laughs> if it fell the other way, that'd be a different story. Yeah. We've got various pictures that show how we, how we repaired that. But basically, we need to replace all the scaffolding, all the cabling. It took 36 hours. And that was in the middle of a gale as well. That was horrendous stuff. We were actually watching 
our internal network. And we noticed that's like, well, flying at 9 a.m. on a Saturday. I thought, that's very strange. It's, it's going to be power. By the time I drove up to the top, I realized that that's a picture from the car. And that thing at the top is actually a ladder on the roof going, better, 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 better in the wind. I got out and I could barely walk across here, such as the power of the wind. Yeah, so that's what, that's what happens. Things fall over, things fall off. We're still dealing with some dishes that are pointed way off where they should be. So, you know, nobody ever factors this in, but this is what happens. <clears throat> that's the 7,000 quid link. We decided to move it somewhere else. That's a, it, it's a, that's a concrete, it's an I-beam buried in concrete that they're mounting it onto. So that will, that will not move. <laughs> that will not blow over. <laughs> but it took three of them to get it up there. That's how heavy it is, especially in the middle of a storm. We went around to install fiber internet to one guy's house, and uh, the installers went around, uh, banged at his door, mentioned there was smoke coming out of his roof. Uh, he didn't know he had a loft fire, so his house uh, almost burned down. It took the fire service three hours to get water to there, by which time it was, you know, almost definitely trashed. So, yeah. He moved into another house he had, and we got fiber internet up and running within a day. And that's the sort of thing that happens in the country. You know, people will have accidents and the houses will get destroyed. And you, as a good Samaritan, will actually try and get them up and running as quickly as possible because you're not a complete, an absolute BT, for instance. Yeah. His reputation is all. <laughs> yeah. So if a tree falls over on a car traveling at speed, say 40 miles an hour, what will happen is if it hits the right part of the car, the roof, then all it will do is rip off the stuff on the roof bars and dent the roof. And the person driving it, Big Martin, will need new underpants. Um, he almost, I mean, it was a big tree, <laughs> but uh, it just bounced off the roof, thankfully, ripped everything off and he stopped. And when the police came along to write up the ticket, they said, buy a lottery ticket. I thought it was the best piece of advice ever from a policeman. Yeah? Okay, so in summary, how would we find Oh, two minutes to go. In summary, WISPs are not hard, complicated, or expensive, unless, of course, you want to make it reliable. Okay, then it gets expensive, it gets hard, it gets complicated. You will provide, and you will end up providing IT support for every single one of your customers. I've got a new printer, it's not working. My TV doesn't work in the bathroom. Yeah, I bought new line extensions from TP and they're not working. It's your fault. No, it's not. Sky Q boxes are trash. Okay, just burn them with fire. They broadcast on 80 megahertz wide Wi Fi channels all the time at full power, drowning out every other Wi Fi signal within about a mile. TP Link line extenders, trash. Don't ever buy TP Link, especially 650s, because after a while we get bored and they'll set themselves up as DHCP servers. And it's like, well, no, I've got a perfectly good DHCP server on, on my router. Oh, no, no, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them DHCP as well on a completely separate subnet. And the customer goes, my internet's not working. And he's absolutely right. His internet's not working because his laptop is connected to the line extender. And the line extender is going, well, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Thank you. And you bought these. Yes, trash. So you end up with that. Okay. It does take over your life. Uh, there's no escape. You can't go down the pub unless it's working. Yeah, that's kind of sad. And it's difficult to actually make money, okay? As a whisper. The trick is to actually be a proper ISP like Neil and make lots and lots of money. What is the future? The future is fiber to the premises, okay? Where you've actually got your own fiber coming in the door. It might be GPON, it might be least line, who cares? R100 is a Scottish government project that should have delivered 100% of all Scottish properties for at least 30 meg. Two years ago, they're still going. They're still spending about 650 million pounds of their money, and BT will have been finished around about 2026. So they're going to go around quite a lot of the rural areas that I, I'm interested in and actually give these people fiber to the premises. Okay, so it's my job to take my WISP to the next level where I'm in the exchange and I can say, I can sell you fiber to the premises next week. Yeah, and keep them as customers. Yeah, that's my next move. WISP will still be very, very useful for those properties that are literally in the middle of nowhere, okay?